A very good morning to everyone and welcome to N Parks Spotlight. For those of you that have joined our previous talks, welcome back. And for those who are new, thank you for joining us today. My name is Leslie and I am from the National Biodiversity Centre at the National Parks Board. The N Parks Spotlight series is online every Saturday from 10.30 to 11.30 in the morning. You can join us on Zoom or watch the sessions live on YouTube. It is now July and today is the first of our four talks this month. Here is our program, a quick introduction, and then we will hear from Deputy Director at NBC, Loa Hokkyong, about the wonders of our rainforests. And because today, 4th July, is World Firefly Day, we have a special presentation just for you. Did you know that we have fireflies in Singapore? Our senior manager at NBC, Liu Ti, will be sharing more about them in Bright Lights, Big City. If you have questions for either of our speakers, do send them to me, Leslie, as a private message using the Zoom chat. And we will try to address a few of them during the Q&A later on. But for now, it's time to explore our rainforests. Let's welcome Hock Kiong, Deputy Director at the National Biodiversity Centre. Over to you, Hock Kiong. Thank you very much, Leslie. Okay, let me try and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yep, we can see it fine. Thank you. Okay, does it show the whole thing? Does it come up with other things? Uh, it's the whole screen, right? Yes, it's the whole screen. Okay, that's good. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Hokyong. Uh, thank you very much for joining me for my talk this morning. Uh, today, I'm going to share a bit about some interesting things that we have in our rainforest. But first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been working at the National Biodiversity Biodiversity Center since 2008. My main area of work uh, is regarding about plants and our forests. I do a lot of forest surveys to understand the kind of forests we have in Singapore and to find out what we can do to help protect them. During my work, I often encounter many interesting plants, uh, some animals as well, uh, and I hope to share some of them with you today. Okay. Now, first, what are rainforests? Rainforests are forests that occur in tropical and subtropical regions of the world. Uh, are you? Yeah, okay. Um, they usually have climates that are humid, um, ever wet conditions. Uh, we have different kinds of primary forests, uh, different kinds of forests. Uh, primary forests are forests that have never been completely cleared before. We do have that in Singapore. And secondary forests are forests that have formed on land that was cleared in the past, but over time regenerated into forests that look what you see today. Now, the difference between the two types of forests, uh, you can look at that in terms of their forest structure, in terms of the species that you see in these forests. Now, in Singapore, in the past, about 200 plus years ago, it used to be entirely covered with primary forests. If you look at this map, this is of the 18, early 1800s, or pre raffles time. You can actually see that the whole island and offshore island are covered with primary forests or lowland chokup forests. There are parts of it that are freshwater zone forests, as well as mangrove forests around the coastal regions. Now, most of this was actually cleared by 1850s for pepper and bergambia plantations, as well as for nutmegs. And from 1900 onwards, uh, after the, the failure of the pepper and gambia, we have industrial scale rubber plantations as well as oil palms. And this is what you get to see today. Uh, most of the rainforest is no longer there. Uh, again, mostly cleared by the plantations in the past. Now, if you look closely at the, uh, the purple area, uh, this is where our second rainforests are. You can see a bit of green. Those are tiny patches of primary rainforest that are embedded within the matrix of second forest. So, some freshwater swamp forest inside. Uh, secondary forests, even though 
they grew on land that was cleared before, it doesn't mean they are not important. They are also just as important because they serve as a buffer, as well as a wildlife habitat for a lot of the, the animals that live in our forest. Now, forests are important. No matter they are secondary forests or primary forests or even mangrove forests, they're important for water catchment, they're important for nutrient cycling, even within Singapore, and of course, to help keep our climate cool. Now here, it shows you the two main kinds of forests we have on the island itself. So excluding mangrove forests. So on the left, this is a photo taken of the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. I think you can recognize some of the uh, towers over there. This is a lowland tropical rainforest. It grows on dry land uh, up to the hills on Bukit Timah and down to the valleys. Uh, you can see this really a dense canopy covering the, almost the entire uh, land. You can't see the forest floor at all. On the right, you have freshwater zone forest. Uh, it usually occurs on low ground uh, around rivers and beyond the back mangroves areas, usually along uh, streams that go all the way inland. I can see here very clearly because of the high water table, a large part of the ground is actually wet. And here you actually have water pulling out around my colleagues who is doing a survey in the forest. It looks a lot like a uh, mangrove forest, but this is not, this is fresh water. Now the kinds of species you find in a primary forest and secondary forest, uh, you can look at this picture on the left. You see tall columnar tree trunks. Uh, this is in the primary forest again. Uh, these are big shorter trees or saraya. Uh, he's dwarfing my colleague uh, Ali right here in the photo. Uh, they grow very tall. And these are trees that take a long time to grow to mature and they may even live for over a few hundred years. Now, these trees live in different time scales even compared to humans. Like for humans, we, we live up to 70, 80 years old, but these trees, they grow to several hundred years old and by the time they mature, we are already in, in middle age. So we have to try to understand we want to conserve these trees in the forest. We have to think what we can do over their lifespan. The photo on the right shows uh, a typical exotic dominated secondary forest. This is what we call an albizia forest. Uh, the species are very different. The trees, instead of very tall, common, they open up and spread like a bit of umbrella right at the top. Um, but they are still important. Uh, a secondary forest like this takes about 20 to 30 years to develop to its current state compared to a few hundred or even thousand years for a primary forest. But they're just as important. You can see even see eagles nest nesting by the top in this place where there's no more primary forest. In the primary forest, uh, the forest structure are usually found in three to four layers. So here, uh, they are dominated by big tall trees. I mentioned the diptero cups uh, with canopies at about 30 to 40 meters tall and emergence up to 50 to 60 meters tall. So this is a photo of a masawa. Uh, this is taken in Gitima Nature Reserve. It is an emergent. The top of the tree canopy is probably about 15 meters tall. This is one of the rare uh, tiptoe cup trees we have in Singapore. So other than tiptoe cups, we have other things like kempas, which is from the bean family, and jelutong also, uh, frequently used for some of the timbers. Now for tiptoe cups, as its name suggests, it has two wings. Tiptoe cup, two wing seeds. So this is uh, a photo of the, the fruits of the masawa with the two wings. We also have other big trees. This is um, one of the biggest jelutong trees we have in our forest. This is somewhere deep inside my tree. You can see it's actually dwarfing my colleagues here doing a forest survey, trying to measure its girth. But other than the big trees in the forest, we also have smaller trees, but some of them are just as old. So this is a, a photo of uh, Bukitima again. Uh, you have smaller columnar sized trees. Uh, these belong to other families. You can see the canopy right where the sky is. And you see the understory, all you can see is the mid section of the trunk very clear bowl all the way to the top. And then you see a sparse understory with shrubs, herbs, seedlings, and almost very clear forest floor. Now, other than the tall columnar trees, because we are, well, for us, we visit the rainforest, we're usually around the forest floor area. We mainly can see the trunks as well as the roots. Sometimes we see very interesting things like trees with legs. So these are riang riang. Uh, it occurs mainly in the swamp forest areas where the water table is high. So you can see this one actually have a few small legs. 
small lakes, there are also big lakes. This one actually resembles mangrove forest, but this again is in the primary forest on dry land. This is a delinear grandifolia with flying buttresses that are even taller than myself. Now, other things that you find in a primary forest, at least in Singapore uh, and around the Southeast Asia region is they had this phenomenon called massing or general flowering season, where once every three to five years, they start to flower and fruit and mass, meaning the whole forest, you start to see trees come in flower and fruit over several months. Now, how does these trees look like when they are during those masting season? So here's a close-up photo of a soraya. You can see fruits uh, growing on its canopy. You take a step back and look, the whole canopy is covered with its fruits. Uh, even behind the background, uh, you have, can see light-colored green fruits. Those are from the compass emergent tree nearby. You have the Gorongang, which is a crater xylem. The canopy is covered with uh, pink flowers. A mar marawan, which is an antitrocup, smaller in size, uh, but with interesting small yellow flowers as well as a karooing, uh, with its fruits hanging up uh, on a tree after two and a half months when the fruits are almost going to be ripe. Again, with two wings over there. If you walk along the forest floor during the flowering season, what you find is a whole forest floor covered with its flowers. They have dropped overnight. So this is a close-up of one of the karooing flowers. Uh, you can see it's pale in color, or sometimes pinkish in color, and they actually give off a scent so most likely they are pollinated by night flying moths and other night flying creatures. This is the fruits of the compass. Uh, compass is not diprocarp, uh, it's a bean family, as I mentioned. It has a seed that's surrounded by a flat membrane. So it's almost like a one single wing. And this is Saraya with two wings. Uh, there are some round seeds in the photo. These are from Nyato. Some of you work in the industry may know about Nyato wood. We have Nyato trees in our forest as well, and those are native. Now, talking about wings, how many kinds of wings fruits do we have? Jelutong, the big massive tree you saw earlier, have fruits with a single wing. You can see it over here with a seed by the center. Then a karooing with two wings. A marawan or hopia with two wings as well. Oops. And a saraya with three wings. Parisha with four wings. Parisha is not diprocarp, but it, it disperses similarly like diprocarps. Going as it falls, it will turn and twist together as it comes down. Rengas with five wings. Rengas, again, is also not a diprocarp. It is a member of the mango family. So you see the fruits in there look a bit like tiny mangrove, but with wings. Of course, you have the odd kind of wings, uh, boat shaped ones. This is a pterosymbium. It is related to the Qingdeng tree that we have uh, with bulb shaped wings. And they also go twisting and turning around as it comes down from the canopy. Now, our forest, our primary forest, is not just about diprocarps. We have many other species from various families as well, even those with species that occur elsewhere in, in temperate countries. But ours are tropical species. We have those from the mahogany family, it's an eclair with interesting red colored fruits uh, that can grow up to a tennis ball size and dispersed by hornbills. We have wild rambutans. This is different from the rambutans that we eat or find in the, uh, in the market. We have a uh, merdang. Uh, these are very interesting trees with pink colored fruits. Uh, some species are actually edible in Borneo. Of course, how can you forget the durian? Uh, other than the durian that you see in the market, we have our own native durians as well. This is a Singapore durian. Uh, they must also, so we only get them once every three to five years. Uh, unfortunately, they are not edible. Uh, they split up while they are still up on the tree and squirrels and monkeys go after the fruits. Here's a photo of a chingdeng tree, similar to the one we showed earlier, the, the pterosyndium, with boat shaped wings. We have acorns and chestnuts. Uh, acorns and chestnuts, usually we think about them from shows in temperate countries. We visit Europe, we think about acorns, but we have our own tropical acorns and chestnuts in Singapore as well, on our tropical rainforest. We have our Singapore Godonia. Uh, Godonias are sometimes called fried egg plants because of the yellow in the center. We call it, it looks like an egg yolk with an egg white around it, but they are related to the tea tree. If you go to uh, Sri Lanka or you go to Taiwan, you see a tea tree plant, you see the flowers look very similar. This is called Singapore Godonia. It's named after Singapore. We have Rusty
Uh, this is a native mangosteen, we call it a rose candies. It's related to the mangosteen that we eat. Again, very sweet, but a bit small, but still very interesting. And we have so many different kinds of trees or species of trees that we start to name our places after them, from Tampanese in the east to Karanji in the west. Now, as you go down from the under canopy to the understory layer, you have shrubs and small trees. You have the leaf litter plant. I think a lot of you would have seen this before because they are at our level. We have the tenana tree, uh, a bit bigger, about three to four meters, with interesting white flowers. We have the tortilla, which is an interesting shrub as well, with very curious uh, red or flesh colored flowers. We have archidendron with black colored seeds that are on exposed pots when they ripen, attracting birds that come and eat them. We have color lapis, which is related to our jambu, uh, but it's a, a different species. This is not forest understory with interesting flowers. And then we have a shrubby stachylia as well. Uh, this is a shrub level that's maybe about one and a half, one and a half meters. Again, with interesting red pots that open to show the black colored seeds inside. Go on to the herbaceous level. Herbs such as this very rare Conodoboya platypus. It's called platypus because of the leaves that are very broad. Uh, in two spots in Singapore, in the primary forest. You have Lasantius with blue colored berries. You have swamp pepper shrubs. Uh, we have our native peppers, uh, not the kind that you find in the market, but those that are climbing as well as shrubby types. So this is only found in the swamp forest areas. Of course, we have our mouse deer plant with the very interesting red colored berries that are eaten by mouse deers. You have the bat lily. You see this in Bukit Timah Nature Reserve along the trails. You have the scorpion's tail plant, another rare plant uh, in our primary forest with interesting flowers. We had angel's trumpet. Sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't, but they have very nice, interesting, big trumpet-like flowers. Of course, we also have our climbers and our vines and our big lianas. So this is an example of a, a vine that we have, an erythral palm, which actually have this fruit uh, red, in a red capsule or red berry. And when it ripens, it splits open to show the seed inside the black and bluish colored seeds. Very interesting. You have the Ajar Red Leaves Ajaria. This is related to the Morning Glory family, but very interesting, very beautiful flowers. But it's very hard to actually find them. Marstenia, uh, which is only discovered a few years ago uh, in Merici. Also very interesting white flowers. We are trying very hard to conserve them. We have our tropical version of raspberry. This is a broadleaf bramble. It's related to the same raspberry you have in Europe. as so it's related to the apple and pear family. We have our own native jasmine as well, uh, different from those you buy uh, in the flower shops. Teresantis, this is actually related to the grape family, but unlike grapes, which you see individual berries, this one actually has berries growing along on a receptacle, like here you see in a flat red colored piece. So when the berries start to ripen, you actually grow either on stalks that you see coming out along the sides or on the berry itself. So if you can imagine, a raisin biscuit with raisin on it. This is pretty much like it out there in the forest. We have the lex flower cyclia. Uh, a relative of this in Malaya, in Malaysia is used to make uh, jellies that is similar to our grass jelly. And of course we have uh, these uh, Aka Kujubong, uh, which is so named because the fruits resemble those of the real Kujubong, which is known to have hallucinogenic properties, but this one doesn't have those properties. Very interesting fruits with a bit of thorns on its uh, outside capsule. Now, I've been always talking about a lot about plants. Now, what else do I see underneath the canopy? Because I cannot be just look at the plants as well. I will see a lot of the kalugo around in the forest while working there. And of course, there are other small things, butterflies, regular speed vipers. Yes, our, during our survey work, we do see snakes. But for regular speed viper, we know they're actually quite close. Don't pass them, as long as you do not disturb them, they're actually quite harmless. So they are quite all right. We see crabs in our survey work, especially in the swamp forests. 
In the forest leaf litter, we see giant millipedes, we see peel bugs, we see forest cockroach, and this is very cute and very different from the cockroach that we have in our houses or, or in our neighborhoods, because this one doesn't go after our, cra our trash. We have a spiny heel terrapin that you occasionally can see in the leaf litter, and we have fungus of all kinds. Of course, what's so uh, our rainforests are unique uh, as any primary rainforest uh, in Southeast Asia. In Singapore alone, we have recorded over 2,100 native plant species. And this is more than the whole of the native plants found in Great Britain combined. Now, if you look at the, the first few slides that I have, our primary forests are now limited to tiny patches within the nature reserves. But even though they are small, we are still finding rediscoveries, new records, and there are still hidden secrets that are being found through our surveys and fieldwork. For example, the recent uh, Bukit Timah Nature Reserve survey, which we concluded uh, two years ago, we managed to rediscover uh, the, uh, some interesting plants that we thought were lost. The Pania resmosa, which was thought to be extinct. The ornate ratan, again, which was recorded more than 50 years ago, we thought it was extinct, but we found it. We also rediscovered uh, another small pepper bush, uh, pointed pepper or kaduk putan. We also made new records, for example, a syndaxis lucens, which was only once thought to be in Sumatra, and now we find it also in Singapore. Other than new records and rediscoveries, we also are finding endemic plant species that we only know occur in Singapore and not elsewhere around the world. In 2012, our colleagues found a new kind of ginger, which was described in 2014, just in time for our Jubilee year, and it was hence named the Singapore ginger. The same year, we found two more endemic species called uh, Hanguana rubinia, which is here. This is a ruby Hanguana, and so as Hanguana triangulata, again described from Singapore and only found in Singapore. And more recently, we discovered a new species of ground orchid in Singapore and we call it Nevilia singaporeensis. Again, an endemic species only found in Singapore. Now, our rainforests are very important. What are we doing to protect them? All sorts of things that we can uh, beyond our nature reserves, we have to buffer them with parks because we have to keep the microclimate in, we have to ensure that wildlife are able to have enough space to live in the nature reserve, we do a lot of reforestation in places where it's become open and degraded or where there's tree falls. We do surveys and census to find the state of the health of the forest. We try to manage invasive species. This is an example of a Batman plant that some of you might have seen. This invasive is from Africa. Uh, it's taken a stronghold and we've been trying very hard to remove it from our forest. Of course, for the rare plants, we undertake species recovery program it's very difficult to grow some of these plants uh, and it's very hard to find them in fruit. So we are trying all we can, it's not that easy. And of course, we try to do a lot of outreach and education and bring people out to tell them about what we have in our forest, show them the secrets. Because otherwise, if you just walk along the trails, most of the time you just see tall trees, greenery, and that's it. Now, as a visitor, as a member of public, what can you do if you go along the trails it's very easy. Just go there and enjoy the forest ambience, enjoy the quietness, listen, keep your ears open, and you can hear a lot of things, you can see a lot of things, walk slowly, you can find things in the forest understory, you can see some of those flowers, and that's where you discover a lot of secrets. I you tread lightly, because a human step leaves a long impact on the forest floor. Don't take anything from the forest except for photographs, and leave nothing, leave with nothing except for your memories. Do appreciate and take our forest and of course, spread the word to other people around you, your friends, your colleagues. Now, if you want to do more for our parks and forests and nature reserves, do join as a volunteer. You can go to our website to find out more about initiatives and what you can do uh, as a member of public. This is my last slide. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my talk. Uh, you can ask questions later. Now I hand you over to our host, Leslie. Leslie, take it away then. All right, thank you, Hock Kyung. So indeed, our forests are home to a whole variety of 
plants and animals, and some of them are very colourful and interesting as well. And we can try to look out for them the next time we visit our nature reserves and nature parks. So moving on to our bonus segment for this morning. Not sure if we have any American friends in the audience, but if we do, happy 4th of July. Today is actually also World Firefly Day. If you've ever wondered how or why fireflies light up, then we'll, this is a good talk for you because we'll be finding out and learning more from our senior manager at the National Biodiversity Centre, Liu Ti. Once again, if a question strikes you during the presentation, do send it to me as a private message in the Zoom chat. Take it away, Liu Ti. All right, hi guys. Uh, give me a second to share my screen. works okay i think everyone can see my screen you good yep it's right. good. okay hi everybody uh my name is Liu Ti. i'm from the national biodiversity center uh a little bit more about me i'm actually i've only just started working with fireflies maybe a few years ago um my i did i, mean, I studied ecology when i was in uh, university and i actually started working national park sport as an operations manager at east coast park so it was when I was there, um, we actually um, partnered with other nearby parks such as Pasiris Park and we actually discovered that, as in there, I was told by my seniors that there were fireflies in the park. So I was actually very surprised because I lived pretty near Pasiris Park and I've actually never seen fireflies there before. So we started going in there to like do our, uh, our, our little pilot surveys just to see how many there were. But it was more or less sort of like a best kept secret. Most people didn't know that we actually had fireflies in one of our urban parks. And later on in 2016, I moved to a National Biodiversity Center. And uh, this was where I got the opportunity to work on the Firefly Species Recovery Program. And so I'll share a little bit more about the program with you later. And, uh, and, of, and of course, some information about fireflies as well. Okay, so what are fireflies? They're not flies. So a lot of people, because of the name, they think they're flies, but actually fireflies are beetles. Uh, they're from the family Lampyridae. And they are of course nocturnal because they need to use uh, light at night as their visual cues. And they have light organs. So on the bottom left, there's a photo of an of adult male firefly. And most uh, male fireflies have two light organs, while most females only have one. So you can actually see two bands at the bottom left photo. Uh, they also tend to prefer moist areas. Some are actually aquatic. Their larvae live in the water. Most species have wings, but not all will have wings. Uh, as you can see later, I'll show you one. And there are also more than 2,000 species worldwide. So on the top right, I just wanted to highlight, uh, there is a larvae, a photo of a larvae. It's a Lampyrigera larvae. It's actually one of the largest uh, firefly larvae in the world. The adults actually become a lot, a lot smaller, but the larvae are very big and they look like beetle grubs. So how did they produce light? Oxygen is actually combined with luciferin, which is a special chemical in special cells in the firefly light organs. And this produces light. One thing interesting, interesting about the light is that they don't have uh, much heat that's dissipated because you know if you have a light bulb and then there's light that's coming out of it, usually there's a lot of heat that's generated. They can't do that in the fireflies because they will actually be burnt. So they have an interesting way to produce light. Um, most fireflies flash light in patterns that are unique to each species. It's like having their own individual Morse code. And they mostly use the lights to attract potential mates. But there are also theories that the light is also used as a defense mechanism to warn predators that the firefly is not tasty. And some fireflies are actually poisonous. Some firefly species actually flash synchronously, which is to say they flash in sync. Um, I think a very popular example would be the Teropix tenor, which is found in Malaysia, such as in Selangor. So a lot of people actually take firefly tours there to see the fireflies uh, light up the trees, like the Christmas light effect. Unfortunately, we don't have that in Singapore, but uh, we do have our own special firefly species. So on the top left is actually uh, not a photo in Singapore, but in temperate countries, they, the fireflies tend to come out more unmasked. So you can take long exposure photos of the fireflies in the forest. And in the bottom right, uh, this is actually from the US National Park Service. They actually sort of recorded how each individual species uh, does their flashing. So you can, you can see that not all species actually flash the same color. For example, the top one, uh, Foster's, it actually flashes in this bluish green light. And then uh, most of the fireflies, the photinus actually flashes in yellow, but some actually do big flashes, like white flashes. 
So what's so important about fireflies? They are actually known to occur in healthy ecosystems and are often used as bioindicators. They are very intrinsically linked to the habitats they live in. For example, um, the fireflies in Singapore, the mango firefly, for example, the larvae live in the mud, but adults actually live on the trees in the canopy. So they use different parts of the ecosystem in, in their life cycle. They're also very susceptible to human impact. So they are of course very uh, sensitive to light pollution because it like, uh, they use light as their, as their way of life. Uh, they are also sensitive to pesticides, especially during the larval development stage, because a lot of pesticides actually seep into the ground, which is where the larvae live, and of course, urban development. So what about fireflies in Singapore? So this is where everyone always goes, oh, okay, you work on this firefly species recovery program. So yeah, what about, what, what do you know about fireflies in Singapore? And I'm, I'm sorry to say, I don't really know a lot about it. And there's a lot more to be learned about fireflies in Singapore. Uh, just for context, uh, worldwide, they're actually not very well studied as well because there's not a lot of taxonomic expertise. And it's quite difficult to tell different species apart. They actually look quite similar and you need to actually go down to the microscope and you know, sort of look at their light organs or you need to use DNA analysis to tell the species apart. And it's also quite difficult to catch them. So uh, firstly, I think a little bit of our surveys, we actually go into the forest or the mangrove at night and we can't use any light. So we're actually scrambling in the dark. And then if we do see a firefly, which can be quite rare, we try to catch it. But of course we have to do it in the dark and the firefly tends to fly up quite high to the canopy as well. So actually collecting specimens have, have been quite tricky as well. And in Singapore, there are, we estimate there are at least 13 species which are spread across uh, mainly three different habitats, uh, mangrove, forests, and scrubland. So far, um, none of our species are aquatic. So I think uh, in North Asia, like Japan and in uh, Taiwan, a lot of their uh, firefly species, the larvae live in the water. We don't really have that in Singapore, at least not that we know of at the moment. Yeah. Um, firefly density is generally very low in Singapore. Although in, uh, man in the mangroves, they tend to congregate a bit more. So you have sort of a higher density there. So on the right, um, there's a lot of names there, but basically these are what we think are the firefly species in Singapore. As you can see, some are SP1, SP2, or even the genus is not even labeled. So this is kind of like the piecemeal information we have. Uh, our friends over at Lee Kong Chen have been trying to work on uh, documenting more of such firefly species from uh, older specimens. So actually this, this will probably be updated. And on the right, I think more importantly, you can see that everything is data deficient, which means there's very little known about most of these fireflies. So a bit more about mangrove fireflies, which are possibly our most common species or common genus of fireflies in Singapore. Uh, they are called teroptics uh, species. Um, in Singapore, we are, supposed, we are supposed to have three species, but we have not been able to find one for the longest time. So the ones in our mangroves are likely to be uh, teroptics pallida and teroptics melakei. They have non-synchronous fashion, unlike their relatives in Malaysia, but their adults do display in trees. They just don't blink together. And the larvae live in the mud and live lit leaf litter, and they prey on a variety of mangrove snails, although it is likely they also prey on other invertebrates as well. It's just that we have not had a recording of this in Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, Pasir's Park has our highest density of mango firefly, but it could also be simply because the area is very small and quite accessible by boardwalk. So sometimes it could be an observer bias, and a lot more research needs to be done to elucidate this. So on the top right is a photo of a teroptic larvae. They do kind of, they look like little armored grubs. Uh, they're actually quite voracious predators. They will, they will grab a snail and then they will uh, inject venom into it and then eat it. And then the bottom right is the adult teroptic firefly, which was uh, hanging out on the boardwalk, which is why you managed to get a photo of it. So a bit more about forest fireflies, which are mostly unknowns to most of us. Uh, they are, of course, found in forests along forest edges, and sometimes also they venture out to scrub lands near forested areas. Uh, very little is known about them and their taxonomy. Uh, and they naturally occur in low density. And the larvae are terrestrial and Again, like the mangrove larvae, also found on the ground in leaf litter and soil, and again, also recorded the prey of a variety of snails. I think one interesting thing about some of these forest fireflies is that some of the fireflies have uh, exhibited this thing called phenylneoptony, which means the females actually don't become like the adults that we think of, like winged um, flying adults. They actually retain juvenile characteristics, such as being wingless and looking like actual larvae. But the males actually become full adults, so this is quite interesting and probably baffled a lot of scientists previously on why is the male like a adult firefly looking thing and then why is the female still looking like a larvae, yeah. So challenges of conserving fireflies in Singapore, I think the first, uh, first thing is really they are poorly understood in general. 
uh, we don't even know what species we have. Um, the joke I used, always make is that we had this species recovery project for the mango firefly, which was all the while we thought we only had Theropteryx bellida, but it turns out we also had another species called Melakei that lives in that same place and looks almost the same, except for some small morphological characteristics. But when, when you're actually looking at them at night, uh, it's kind of hard to tell them apart. So it became a genus recovery project instead of species recovery project. Uh, there's also little research into the natural history of local species. I think the mango firefly is probably the better studied one uh, in terms of life cycle, what they eat and all this. Uh, there's also very little local experience on firefly conservation measures. Also, I talk a lot about pastures because it's the most accessible site on the mainland to look for fireflies, but most places that have fireflies are actually in restricted areas or are in offshore islands. So it's quite difficult to get there to these spaces and also do outreach for these spaces. Of course, there's also increasing urbanization. Um, we have a lot of light pollution in most urban areas. And there's also, of course, loss of habitat and connectivity as Hokkyong has mentioned in his previous slide, I mean, his previous presentation. So the top right are just two of the mango fireflies that we caught uh, in Pasiris for our specimen collection. And again, about lack of accessibility, if you talk about the mangroves, it's actually very difficult to do um, surveys for the mangrove at night because as you can see, it's quite muddy. And if in daytime already, it's quite difficult to walk around. And then in the night when you actually can't use your light, it's actually quite tricky. Yeah, so we don't do that as often uh, because of all the risk and all that. And, of, and we try not to encourage people to do this as well. So for existing firefly conservation efforts, there's some work that's being done in NPARCs. Uh, it's mostly targeted at the moment for mango fireflies in Pasir Ris Park. So there has been quite a, a long-term habitat enhancement program for Pasir Ris mangrove, which I'll share more a bit later. And also there's some long-term monitoring of the fireflies at Pasir Ris mangrove. So on the top right, uh, there's some of our colleagues who are actually surveying um, snail availability and uh, prey abundance in the mangrove. And in the bottom right, uh, Yusuf, our manager at, uh, park manager at Pasir Ris Park has actually been cultivating uh, mangrove plants in his nursery. So that, that photo is of his nursery. So just a bit more about Pasir Ris Park mangroves. Uh, again, probably the only mainland site that is accessible because the boardwalk is actually open at night. But take note, if you do go there, there are no lights inside. So you have, you know, do take the necessary precautions and all this and don't go alone. And now don't go more than uh, in a group of five as well. Uh, it's small, uh, it's only six hectares, which Sometimes we think maybe the reason why we think it's very, uh, the, the density of fireflies is high is simply because it's actually very small. There's very little habitat area for them. Uh, we believe it's actually a remnant mangrove habitat, which hasn't actually been developed for at least 50 years, at least based on old maps of the region. But the hydrology of the area has been modified. I mean, right outside this mangrove, there is a huge canal, which is uh, Sungai Tempanisa. Yeah. But yet the mangrove still persists. And and amazingly, fireflies still live here, although we think they're likely to be an isolated population because there's, it's just a tiny patch mangrove and uh, around it is surrounded by uh, urban development. Uh, some of the habitat enhancement things we do, um, it's actually quite a lot of manual labor. There's a lot of uh, channel digging to maintain uh, tidal input into the mangroves uh, because the, the surrounding hydrology has been modified. We also collect mangrove propagules to establish new mangrove plants in the nursery and not just from pastures as well. Um, I think M parks usually sort of like um, treats plants around different, around different parks so that there's some sort of like genetic mixing. Uh, we also plant mangroves with our partners, uh, mostly to the Garden City Fund to restore bare areas of the mangrove and also to expand the habitat a bit so that we can give more space for the animals living inside. And recently we just uh, replaced the park lights outside the mangrove with wildlife friendly lights. So these lights have a uh, longer wavelength, which uh, so it is more sensitive uh, for wildlife. They have lower lux level, so they're not as bright. And most importantly, they're actually directed away from the mangrove because uh, the older lights were actually um, 360. So these are just directional and downward to the footpaths. Yeah, and we actually, um, after doing this, we actually do not, uh, record a drop in lux level within the mangrove. So it's actually darker now in the mangrove and hopefully this will actually help the fireflies. Uh, for long-term monitoring, it's basically a lot of population surveys. Uh, I think the that's the, the the thing we do is we walk in the in the on the boardwalks in the mangrove at night, and then we record the number of uh, adult and larvae that we see. We also take some habitat parameters when we do these uh, population surveys to see whether there's anything that sort of like correlates to the population trends of the firefly. So some of the parameters we identify on the right and the in the middle in the table, um, such as prey availability, uh, tide salinity of the water and light, in, especially light intensity. 
So these are some preliminary findings. Uh, of course, we need a lot more data collection to illustrate any proper trends. Uh, generally, we find that firefly abundance just varies greatly throughout the year. There's no clear pattern at this point in time, except that when there's a lot of adults, we see a lot less larvae and vice versa, which sort of makes sense because they, they do have their own life cycle, uh, which is about seven months, and then you know, and they probably just follow it through throughout the year. Uh, interestingly, um, when we try to do daily surveys, they there's actually already a huge variation day to day. So we actually think a lot of this might be observer bias because sometimes we are restricted to our boardwalks through the mangrove. So we if like let's say all the fireflies are in one other section of the mangrove, which is not accessible by boardwalk, we don't see them. So this to sort of like even this out, we need to do actually a lot more surveys to collect more data. And we also want to compare this data with other habitat assessment parameters to see if maybe if like the lights are working. So if it's darker, does it mean we see more fireflies? So some of our upcoming research, uh, which we are planning to do one, and now that phase two has just started, we are hoping to be able to start. Um, the first is to re revisit Singapore's firefly checklist. And the second is to uh, work on pre-identification for the mango firefly. So previously, there's actually been some work done by our colleagues uh, on fireflies. Um, there was a big nationwide survey in 2009 to 2011, which sort of came up with the preliminary list of 13 species. Uh, and there was a, <clears throat> a bit more comprehensive survey in Pula Obin uh, re more recently, and the paper has been published on that. So that, that we know a bit more about fireflies now, but there hasn't, I think it's timely to actually redo the checklist because there are more sites that we uh, hear about from our other colleagues working, doing their own other research in other forests where they've also spotted fireflies. So we would like to increase the number of sites being surveyed to see if we can find more. And also um, with uh, leaps in technology, we're also hoping to use DNA techniques for identification so that Hopefully it won't just all be like genus one species question mark when we actually do up the list. Uh, our second project is um, to identify mango firefly prey. So I think a lot of um, anecdotal um, evidence and also a lot of papers have talked about them preying on snails. But we also know that from talking to other international uh, experts that that probably isn't the only thing they eat. And the key factor in ensuring a a sustainable population is also to actually uh, to ensure that their prey population is also sustained as well. So it'll be a good information to know. And uh, we are hoping to actually use DNA techniques again to identify um, mango firefly uh, prey using their gut DNA. So this can also help us inform our habitat enhancement efforts. So we don't just enhance just for the firefly, we also enhance for um, animals that are related to their life cycle, such as their prey. So this is my last slide. Uh, it's similar to Hokkyung's last slide, which is how can you help? At the moment, we don't have a lot of opportunities for volunteering directly with the Firefly Species Recovery Program. We're hoping to expand this, but the best thing you can do is actually sometimes nothing at all, which is don't uh, do not enter our nature reserves at night. Um, they're actually closed uh, to 7 p.m. because a lot of our sensitive wildlife, like the fireflies, are nocturnal. And of course, they'll go off trail in our nature reserves and nature parks. Uh, because you, you could be trampling on some of the saplings and all the plants that are needed. Um, I need to expand on the take nothing but photos and do it without flash because the flash will generate scale of the fireflies. Uh, we tried that before and we don't do it. We don't do it as often anymore. We just took like a couple of photos for the purpose of having a presentation, but we try not to disturb them with light. Uh, we leave nothing but footprints. And of course, to dispose of litter responsibly because when we do go to mangrove, of course, the tide brings in some trash from perhaps Indonesia, but we also shouldn't contribute more to that. And we can also support our local conservation programs by uh, Garden City Fund. Um, I think Tsinging will be sending a, li a list of links where we can, uh, for our community nature programs as well, where you can volunteer. So um, this is my last slide and I will hand it over to Leslie. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you Liu Ti for sharing with us about our, our fireflies and giving us a little insight into the research and conservation as well. So we will now proceed with our Q&A. Thank you to all those who submitted the questions. So our first question will be for Hock Kyung. How big is the girth of that massive Jalutong tree that was shown by, was shown by you in your photo? Okay, um, that photo was taken quite a few years ago. Uh, I remember when we were measuring it, uh, it was about six plus meters. Uh, and it took at least four persons to hold our hands around a big tree in order to get the girth of that tree. 
the tree is quite tall. Uh, it was close to 60 meters as well. Um, but yes, it's huge, very, very huge. Okay, so it is massive indeed. So about six plus meters girth and maybe like 60 meters tall. Okay, yeah. uh, the next question will be for Hock Kyung to answer as well. Why can't we okay. visit the nature reserves at night? Of course we can't because the nature reserves and nature parks as well uh, are set aside to protect our wildlife. We can visit, visit our nature parks and nature reserves from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, but because they are home to many of our native species, disturbing or uh, visiting them after 7 p.m. or before 7 a.m. may actually disturb them a lot especially for nocturnal animals that need to roam around at night. Um, so, in order to minimize our disturbance, please do visit them only during daylight hours between 7 in the morning and before 7 p.m. Okay, so we do not want to disturb our nocturnal animals. And I, it, I think it's also for the visitors' own safety as well. Yes, so for definitely. the safety of both us and the animals we should only visit during the opening hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. All right. The third question is also for Hock Kyung. A lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. So why is it that we can only hike on N Park's designated trails or like basically not just hiking, but anything that we do in the nature reserves or the nature parks, why is it that we have to stay on the designated trail? This is actually very, very important, uh, not just for us, but also for the wildlife and the forest in general. Uh, because the trails are there for public to enjoy and to appreciate the forest um, while trying to ensure as little impact as possible to the for fragile forest environment. Um, it's also for our safety because people can always get lost inside the forest. You never know. Uh, you might actually encounter things in forest that might be... Um, that might actually affect a person. Now, if a person wander off trail, um, they may get lost, number one. And second, they may most likely will be traveling on a leaf litter where a lot of the rare tree seedlings, as well as the rare herbaceous plants, including some of our rarest endemic plants are. And if a person doesn't really see where they are, it's very easy to just step on them and just damage them. Of course, uh, is for everyone's safety as well. So please do stay on the trails. Sometimes some trails are actually marked as closed. Uh, there are reasons for that because uh, it could be that we're trying to let the, the trail recover or the trail may actually have some hazards which we are trying to clear or trying to remediate. So that's why it's important to keep on our impacts designated trails. So we do that and we ensure we minimize our impacts to the forest habitat as much as possible. Uh, it's also to ensure our own safety and not to disturb any of the wildlife. Okay, thank yes. you, Hock Kyung. Yeah, so again, question. safety is priority. And yeah. also, it's um, if we want to protect our biodiversity, it's important that when we are using our nature reserves, it's good that we enjoy them, but stay on the designated trails and only visit during the official opening hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay, thank you, Hock Kyung. So now we'll move on to questions for Liu Ti. So this person says, I've seen fireflies in Japan and was told that they only come out at certain periods of the year. Is this the case for fireflies in Singapore? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so actually, it's not the case in Singapore, at least for our mango fireflies. Um, I think it's the same reason why Japan has seasons and we don't. Um, five, fireflies, like most insects, actually prefer warmer temperatures. So in most non-temperate um, countries, they tend to come out around spring to summer. So I, I think the ones in Japan are actually the aquatic ones. Uh, we've read articles about those in the palaces and then there's like a very nice restored uh, aquatic habitat and then the fireflies appear en masse. They, that doesn't really happen in Singapore. So uh, for them, I think the aquatic larvae just uh, become or become adults at the same time but in Singapore because we are tropical so they're actually year round which is maybe better because any time of the year you can actually see fireflies in Singapore. Yeah. Okay so in places with like a warmer climate like Singapore fireflies could be found all year round rather than seasonally and I think we also heard from you that they 
don't um, emerge as a large group, unlike the ones which we might see in Japan. Okay, one final question. Can we have firefly tours in Singapore? Ooh, oh, this is hard. Okay, uh, I think I mentioned that the most successful site is Pasir Ris Park, and we have actually had firefly tours in the past. Uh, they are not common because we actually don't want to have too many people going inside the mangrove at night. Uh, but now and then, when we actually host our flagship events such as Festival of Biodiversity, we do actually hold uh, one or two firefly tours in conjunction with these events. Um, of course, now with COVID, that might be a bit tricky, but we do hold them uh, sometimes. So just do look out for them. Uh, I also actually got a private message question, uh, which I can address. So someone uh, wrote in to me to ask that, Sorry, let me see. Oh, um, how does light pollution affect fireflies? So actually, um, maybe I didn't elaborate much, but the most of the uh, fireflies actually require light to, as in use their light signals to find their mates. So if there's light pollution, right, they cannot actually signal to each other. So their communication is actually disrupted. So when that happens, they won't be able to mate and they won't be able to produce the next population, which is uh, why they are very sensitive to light pollution. Yeah. Okay, thank you Liu Qi for sharing. So this brings us to the end of our Q&A. But before we wrap up, both Hock Kiong and Liu Qi mentioned some of our volunteer programs, species recovery and habitat enhancements. And all of these are part of our Nature Conservation Master Plan, which details our systematic approach to conserving our rich biodiversity. If you want to find out more, do watch our first NPARC Spotlight Talk on YouTube there is a segment in it where our group director, Lim Liang Jim, outlines this plan. You can also check out the links being shared in the Zoom chat. All of our previous talks in June are also on the NPARC's SG YouTube channel. From the mysteries of the creatures of the night to sea turtles that nest on our shores and the treasures beneath our tides. Do join us for our upcoming sessions as well. We still have a few slots remaining for the Zoom session on 25th July, not just web builders. But all of our talks can also be streamed live on YouTube. So now I'd like to wrap up by saying a big thank you to Hock Kiong and Liu Qi and our audience in both Zoom and YouTube for joining us today. If you have any feedback about today's talk, do share it with us by scanning the QR code on the left. And if you want to find out about upcoming talks, you can scan the QR code on the right or look out for updates on NPARC's social media platforms. The links for all these are also being shared in the chat. So with that, we have come to the end of today's session. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Enjoy your weekend. Take care and stay safe.